very good evening everyone i dr selvamani from meenakshi mission hospital madurai the temple city of india take great pleasure to welcome you all to an academic feast the holistic approach to abc's of intervention cardiology we have an engaging and stimulating program that will focus on acute coronary syndrome bifurcation and calcium each day we have two sessions learn from the masters and keynote lecture by eminent international faculties a live case each day from various reputed centers from us and in from india 10 expert strategies by various experts on managing the challenges in acute coronary syndrome bifurcation and calcium two debates and two case based discussions over 180 minutes of learning every day i take this opportunity to extend my warm welcome to our international faculty for today they don't need any specific introduction they are all doyens in the respective field they are all masters teachers and uh, great academicians dr greg stone dr shamim sharma shripal bangalore from usa and we have dr nick west from united kingdom it's an honor for me to welcome my respected teachers and seniors dr ajit malasari dr ab mehta pravin chandra ms siremath and dr Ale uh, thomas alexander i welcome all my fellow intervention cardiologists in india and people joining across from the globe and today being the first day our focus would be on various approaches towards the management of acute coronary syndrome we shall start the day with learn from the master session we shall be getting updated from latest from tct 2020 conference after the update we shall be going live to mount sinai hospitals new york for live case followed by a keynote lecture from shamim sharma after the keynote lecture we shall be splitting into two different auditoriums that is box 1 and 2 where our national expert shall be will be sharing their strategies to manage the challenges in acute coronary syndrome management now without much ado i hereby start the conference with the latest update from tct in our learn from the masters session we have got three masters today and to facilitate learn from the masters session we have dr nick west now i would like to invite dr nick west dr nick west is from cambridge uk he is currently working from working at uh, papworth hospital and which is a very large uh, specialist cardiothoracic center he has very high interest in clinical research and actively participated in development of coronary devices now i request dr nickwest to take over and uh, go ahead with the further proceedings in this session dr nickwest please dr selvamani thank you very much indeed for that very kind introduction Um, I am indeed speaking to you from the United Kingdom, so it's good afternoon, not good evening, from here, and good morning to my colleagues in the U.S. Um, I should also disclose one further thing that you didn't uh, include in my biography. I should disclose that about a year ago I became the Chief Medical Officer of Abbott Vascular, uh, which is my current role. But I'm very glad to be with you all here today, and as you've outlined, we have an excellent program. Uh, we have three updates from TCT. I'll, I'll just run over them, and then we can get on with the uh, with with the meat of the science. For the first uh, 20 minutes, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Greg Stone, who I'm sure everyone knows is the Director of Academic Affairs for the Mount Sinai Heart Health System at the Akan School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, and obviously it has an important role at the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. He'll be talking about science safety data in the real world and the latest clinical updates. We'll then be hearing from Dr. Shripal Bangalore, Director of Complex Coronary Intervention and Professor of Medicine at the NYU School of Medicine in New York, about how stent design and polymer can impact clinical outcomes. And then to close the session, uh, we'll change gears slightly to intracoronary imaging, and we will be hearing from Dr. Ronnie Matthew from the Lissy Hospital in Cochin about his experience with the Ioptico study. So, Greg, can I ask you to tell us something about? Science safety data in the real world and some insights from TCT. Great to see you. Great, Nick. Great to see you too, and thank you for the opportunity to share my insights on this important topic. So let me start by sharing my slides on this important topic. So you should be able to see my slides now. So assuming that's the case, I will go forward. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to talk about Zion safety data in the real world, uh, latest clinical updates, and also focus on the new data that's come out in patients that are at high bleeding risk. Uh, and the real question is, does Zion afford a shortening DAP duration in these patients because they're such prone to bleeding? So I have no relevant disclosures for this talk. So when we talk about DAP duration, it's all about balance. And we know that, that obviously patients who are undergoing PCI with drug eluting stents can have ischemic events, either myocardial infarction, stent thrombosis, or stroke, and those can lead to death. But we've learned in the last decade that equally as important is bleeding, whether it's access site bleeding, intracranial hemorrhage, GI bleeding, GU bleeding, or other bleeding, major bleeding can have at least as big an effect on subsequent mortality as myocardial infarction and can lead to death. So we, some patients have um, risk factors for both of these conditions. Other patients have risk factors primarily for ischemia more so than bleeding or vice versa. And depending on the relative risks for ischemia and bleeding, that gives us a good indication of how we should try to balance DAP duration. But an important issue, if we're especially going to shorten DAP duration, is do we have the right kind of stent that is thromboresistant enough to try to minimize the ischemic event rates? So um, uh, we and others have published uh, 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 review articles on what are the risk factors for ischemia and bleeding after PCI with drug eluting stents. And there are certainly many factors that are noted for high bleeding risk, such as advanced age, um, prior bleeding, bleeding diatheses, um, uh, elderly, female gender, chronic renal insufficiency, chronic anticoagulation therapy, et cetera, et cetera. And we also know that there are um, substantial predictors of high ischemic risk, such as high-risk patients with acute coronary syndromes, thrombus, um, prior uh, ischemic events on DAP, that is you failed dual antiplatelet therapy, prior myocardial infarction, Again, chronic renal dysfunction, so some overlapping uh, features. Diabetes are both risk, is both a risk factor for bleeding and ischemia. But, um, and, and first generation drug eluting stents or stents that do not support a short DAP strategy because of increased strut thickness or uh, polymer um, either reactions, inflammation or propensity for platelet deposition. So if you've got patients at high bleeding risk, but low ischemic risk, that would favor a short DAP duration, less than six months, perhaps three months, or maybe even in extreme cases, one month. If on the other hand, you have factors of high ischemic risk, that would favor either a one year or even longer DAP strategy. So when we think about the high bleeding risk patient, and there's been a lot of emphasis on this patient because um, age is a really unique factor. Um, age is probably the number one predictor for bleeding risk, but it's not necessarily a predictor for ischemic risk. So when, and, and many of these are unique factors uh, for bleeding, but not ischemia, such as treatment with oral anticoagulants or the new oral anticoagulants, previous bleeding, anemia or other hematologic disorders, coagulation disorders, chronic treatment with steroids or non-steroidals. All of those are unique. Renal dysfunction probably predicts both, but all the others are unique in predicting primarily bleeding. So are drug eluting stents safe with short DAPT? And what's the optimal stent for short DAPT in the high bleeding risk patient? So in this talk, I'm going to talk specifically about these applications for the Zion's cobalt chromium everolimus eluting stent. And you all know this stent well. It's been the standard and the stent probably with the best long-term data now for a decade. Um, it's got multi-link um, cobalt chromium L605 alloy design. It's a thin strut of 81 microns. Um, the drug is everolimus, but probably the most unique aspect of it is the polymer coating. And it's got a durable coating, so it's there forever, but it's a unique coating in that it's a fluorinated copolymer. So it's two different types of fluorinated polymers. And fluorinated polymers are known to be thromboresistant. They selectively retain al albumin and they minimize or inhibit platelet adhesion. So this is the uh, polymer uh, composition of the Zion stent. Um, uh, it's uh, vanillidine flu um, fluoride and hexafluoropropylene. It had been a big trade secret for a long time, but this is what it is. It's used in new cardiovascular, neurologic, and ophthalmic applications such as sutures when you want to uh, inhibit um, thrombus formation. 
And again, it's very elastomeric. So as you know, the polymer does not crack or split or web or at least minimal such properties when the stent expands. Uh, and it's very stable and it's very biocompatible. But perhaps most importantly, it's very thromboresistant. And you can see that there are numerous studies here. I won't go through them all in detail, but if you look at taking standard polymers and then you take fluorinated polymers or um, metallic materials or uh, polypropylene, um, uh, polyethylene, et cetera, you can see that when you fluorinate these materials, the likelihood of thrombus formation or platelet deposition is markedly reduced, goes down 80 to 90% in contact applications. So Elozar Edelman and his group has done some very uh, uh, nice studies of this to show what happens um, with the Zion stent compared to even a bare metal stent. And if you take a bare metal multilink vision, so the same stent as Zion's but without the polymer on it or without the Everolimus, um, 81 micron strut thickness in um, uh, this uh, pulsatile Chandler loop model in a pig, you get this amount of platelet deposition or platelet cell adhesion. And this, of course, is very dependent on strut thickness. If you make the struts thicker, such as in first generation drug eluding stents, and even some stents that are still in use today, that are still thick strut stainless steel stents, then you increase platelet deposition. But if you take the Zion's V stent, which is the 81 micron multilink vision plus about a 15 micron polymer of the fluorinated polymer, uh, not only is it a little bit thicker than Zion's, but you'll notice that the platelet deposition is 24% less uh, in this model, which is statistically significant. So despite slightly greater thickness, there's more resistance to platelet deposition, and that's because of the fluorinated polymer. So how does this translate in the real world? Well, the first thing to know is that there's very strong data to suggest that in a broad cross-section of patients, that the Zion stent is more thromboresistant and actually lowers ischemic complications and stent thrombosis compared to even bare metal stents. And not a lot of people know this, but there's actually been five randomized trials of the Zion's Everolimus eluding stent versus um, the multilink stent. So five randomized trials and almost 5,000 patients. Here are the studies, and these are patients from all comers to STEMI to lower risk patients to octogenarians, so a broad cross-section of patients. But overall, um, you can see um, the ages, mean age 67, although in, in, in the Zima study, it was 83. And uh, again, nearly 5,000 randomized patients. And Marco Valjamigli has pooled all this data into a patient-level pooled analysis. And you can see looking at um, the Zion, uh, looking at the multilink vision bare metal stent um, out to about two years compared to the um, Zion stent, you can see a marked reduction, about a 60% reduction in stent thrombosis. And here's all the individual trial data. You can see that this translates into a 30% reduction in myocardial infarction with, again, the drug eluting stent compared to a bare metal stent. This translates into a reduction in cardiac death. So you've got everything you want. You have less myocardial infarction, less stent thrombosis, and less cardi and cardiac death. And of course, a marked reduction in target vessel revascularization because the Zion stent's a potent drug eluting stent. So it's safer and it's more effective. And again, for this reason, there's really no reason to even have bare metal stents available anymore. But now all of these patients were treated with longer courses of dual antiplatelet therapy. So what data do we now have that we can take advantage of these properties and shorten the dual antiplatelet therapy? Well, we really have two sources of important data. And the first is a meaningful randomized trial. And this is called the STOPDAP2 trial. This was a trial in 3,090 patients that was recruited at 90 Japanese sites. And they wanted to take a, um, a nearly all comer population and randomize them to either a one month of DAP versus 12 months of DAP. And in the one month DAP arm, they dropped the aspirin. So they just kept the clopidogrel going after one month. Now, it was supposed to be an all comers trial, but of course, it's always important to look at how the trial was done and what patients they enrolled. So they did enroll 38% of patients with acute coronary syndrome. So that's important. That's a relatively high percentage. But these were very simple lesions. Uh, this is non-complex coronary disease. The syntax score was eight. Uh, 
There was 1.3 stents per patient, total stent length 30 millimeters, so kind of moderate. Uh, and the other thing that's, of course, very unique in Japan is that they used intravascular imaging in 98% of patients. And this, of course, is going to ensure good stent apposition um, and expansion, and we know is strongly associated with a reduction in MACE. But that said, with those types of patients, a lot of ACS, but simple lesions um, and, and almost routine intravascular imaging, their primary endpoint was net adverse clinical events combination of cardiovascular death, MI, stent thrombosis, stroke, or Timmy major minor bleeding. And this was really powered for non-inferiority. So you've got the 12-month um, DAP group, the control group, 12 months of aspirin and clopidogrel in red. And in the purple is the one-month DAP group. So one month of DAP, then followed by just clopidogrel. And actually, the net adverse events were less in the one-month DAP group. So statistically significantly less by about 36%. When you look at the safety, you would think that reducing Timmy or major or minor bleeding should certainly occur. And it did. Timmy major or minor bleeding. And of course, there's nothing minor about Timmy minor bleeding. That's a big bleed. You could see was reduced by about 70% in the patients who had only one month DAP compared to um, a 12 month DAP. So that's not a surprise. The real question is, was the Zion Sense safe, safe with only one month DAPT? And here are the safety data. And you can see the curves are very similar to each other. This is cardiovascular death, MI, stent thrombosis, or stroke, 2.5% um, versus 2%. So it met the criteria for non-inferiority. And in fact, if anything, the MACE rates were about 20% less with one month DAPT compared to 12 month DAPT. Now, you will note, of course, these MACE rates are very low, okay? And they're very low because they were simple lesions, all implanted with intravascular imaging. Um, so I think we could, we could make a strong um, conclusion that in simple lesions implanted with intravascular imaging, even if some of them have acute coronary syndromes, that you're going to have excellent MACE rates after Zion's implantation with only one month DAPT, and you're going to reduce major bleeding. And this, again, was one month DAPT with uh, clopidogrel. So very strong. But what about high bleeding risk patients? What about more complex patients? Um, this was not a trial just of high bleeding risk patients. It was a trial of kind of all comers. So some high bleeding risk patients, but also low bleeding risk patients with relatively simple lesions. So that's where it was very important that at TCT, Roxana Moran and Marco Valjumigli just presented the results from the um, Zion short DAP program. And these were the regulatory studies in both the United States and Europe to lead to uh, labeling for short DAP indication. And these data are brand new. So the, the labeling is not there yet, but the data has been out now for about two weeks. So there were two separate programs. One was called Zion's 90 which is three month DAPT, uh, followed by monotherapy. And this was enrolled at 101 sites in the United States in 2047 patients, so big registries. And then there was the Zions 28 program. This was a one month DAPT program. And it was a global program in 52 sites with 963 patients, so outside the US. And then in the US, another 58 sites with 642 patients. So all together, uh, more than 1,600 patients. So a total of about 3,600 patients were treated with either one month DAPT or three months DAPT. Now here are the two different studies. So uh, these are prospective, single arm, multi-center, open label, non-randomized studies. But as you'll see with pre-specified historical controls. This is Zions 90, three months DAPT, and Zions 28, which is one month DAPT. So you have your index PCI, and then in Zions 90, you have three months of aspirin plus a P2Y12 inhibitor, and then you drop at three months the P2Y12 inhibitor. Now, importantly, the only patients they enrolled are those patients at three months who were so-called clear of adverse events. That's clear of either major ischemic events or clear of bleeding events. So it would be safe and reasonable to drop the um, uh, uh, P2Y12 inhibitor. And then from three months to 12 months, they were maintained on aspirin only. And the primary analysis period was to see what happened between three and 12 months 
in these event-free patients at three months at whom the P2Y12 inhibitor was dropped, whatever it was. The Zions 28 uh, study is similar, except here they look to see if at one month, patients were clear of either ischemic or bleeding vents. And in one month, they then dropped the P2Y12 inhibitor. And their primary analysis period was to see what happened between one and six months, which is really the high risk period after you're treating the patients with aspirin only. So the key inclusion criteria are that people had to have at least one high bleeding risk criteria. They had to be either elderly, greater than 75, be on chronic oral anticoagulation therapy, have chronic kidney disease, uh, baseline anemia, um, hematologic disorders, major bleeding in the last year, or a history of stroke. And they had to have multiple angiographic criteria. Uh, they had to have a successful PCI with all Zion stents. They had to have vessels that were at least 2.25 to 4.25 millimeters in diameter, target lesions, in Zions 90 of less than 32 millimeters in length, but no such restriction in Zions 28. And they could have up to three target lesions with up to two target lesions per vessel. So there could be stenting of two different vessels. Now, in terms of a clinical exclusion criteria, there were some important exclusion criteria. Uh, STEMIs were excluded from this experience, but not non-STEMIs. LVEFs less than 30%. And plan surgery within one or three months of PCI, depending on if you were in Zions 90 or Zions 28. They also excluded lesions containing thrombus in Zions 90, but not in Zions 28. PCI with overlapping stents, and if the target lesion was the left main, a vein graft, um, or, or a mammary, um, instant restenosis, or chronic total occlusion. So they did exclude some high risk clinical scenarios and some high-risk angiographic scenarios as well, but they included moderately high-risk patients and moderately complex PCI. So here's the, dip is the, the patient disposition in Zions 90 and Zions 28. So a total of 2,047 patients and 1,605 patients. And the three-month clear assessment is the important assessment and the one-month clear assessment were they um, free of a scheme or um, uh, hemorrhagic events, and were they compliant? That was another inclusion to um, go on in this trial. And the patients who got to the three-month clear assessment, 88% of them um, were free of those events and were compliant with drug. And in the Zions 28, it was 90%. And so these patients then went on and had their um, 1,693 and 1,392 had the P2Y12 inhibitor dropped for another nine months in Zions 90 and another five months in Zions 28. So what were their high bleeding risk criteria? You can see that in both Zions 90 and Zions 28, they're really quite similar. The number one criteria is advanced age, greater than or equal to 75, um, with about um, half of those having that as the only criteria to get in the study. The second most important criteria was oral anticoagulation therapy in about 40% of the patients in both groups. And then you can see low hemoglobins, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and an average, uh, um, just to say, an average of around 1.5 or 1.6 high bleeding risk criteria per patient. So again, looking at these patients, this is Zions 90 and Zions 28. These are elderly patients from the criteria, about 75 years of age, a third are women, a lot of cardiac risk factors with about 40% of the patients having diabetes, um, moderately severe renal dysfunction, uh, as you would expect. Um, acute coronary syndromes in about a third of the patients, but I do highlight here that not many patients had true non-STEMI. So most of these were biomarker unstable um, angina patients. So about 7% and 18% were the higher ischemic risk non-STEMI patients. And remember, STEMI patients were excluded. And I will go into the risk scores, but these are patients that are at moderate risk score for ischemic complications and high risk scores for hemorrhagic complications. Um, radial access was used in the majority of patients. And interestingly, uh, you could see from Zions 90 to Zions 28, it actually increased. So about 71% radial access, that's a good thing to decrease bleeding. 
Um, multi-vessel disease in half the patients, moderately complex lesions, as you can see. You can see LADs, circs, and rights, about three millimeter vessels were enrolled, and the lesion lengths were about 16 or 17 millimeters. So looking at the antiplatelet um, uh, adherence, you can see that starting at three months in Zions 90 and starting at one month in Zions 28, uh, the compliance was very good. So the vast majority of patients were just maintained on aspirin monotherapy. You can see that looking um, at DAP, there were some patients in both groups in the yellow curves that maintained on DAP, but less than 10%. There were a few patients who were also maintained on the P2Y12 inhibitor instead of the aspirin, which is what the protocol wanted, but the vast majority on aspirin only. So the primary endpoint was all-cause death or MI uh, to see if it was safe to drop the P2Y12 inhibitor. Um, and this was compared in Zions 90 and Zions 20 to a historical control, which I'll describe in a second. Key secondary endpoints were bark bleeding compared <laughs> to and then definite or probable stent thrombosis in Zions 90 only compared to a pre-specified performance goal. The historical control was Zions VUSA. And this is a large po prospective multi-center uh, post-approval study for the Zion stent. And this was done about a decade ago. So this is older data, but it was a large registry. It was an all comers registry of 8,000 patients from 192 sites in the United States. And it was a real world population. If anything, these lesion characteristics are actually more complex than were um, enrolled in uh, the Zions 28 and Zions 90 patients. But it was not all high bleeding risk patients, but more complex lesions. So the MACE rates should be relatively high. And here you were supposed to use DAPT in one year in most of the patients. And you could see at this time when the study was done, and you could see the high compliance rates of dual antiplatelet therapy in this control. So what was done here, and I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but they did in Zions 90, a propensity matched analysis of those patients who were um, on DAP for only the first three months in Zions 90 compared to the first 12 months in Zions VUSA. And then they did a propensity matched uh, uh, um, stratified, stratified analysis. In Zions 28, they took the patients who were one month free of um, one month clear of events and then were on DAP for only one month and then aspirin monotherapy. And they compared them to Zions VUSA patients who were on six months of dual antiplatelet therapy and then did a propensity adjusted stratified analysis. So this is the results. So was it safe to drop the um, P2Y12 inhibitor in Zions 90 from three months to 12 months? And here you can see that the rate in Zions 90 of death or MI in that uh, nine month period was 5.4%. In the stratified group, it was 5.4%. And this met the pre-specified criteria for non-inferiority uh, with a p-value of 0 0.006. So very similar MACE rates compared to what would have been expected in this propensity adjusted analysis. If you now go to Zions 28, was it safe to drop the um, a P2Y12 inhibitor at one month? What happened between one and six months? In Zions 28, there was a 3.5% incidence of death or MI compared to 4.3% in the stratified Zions v. USA patients. So if anything, a little bit lower in the Zions 28 group, and that clearly met criteria for non-inferiority. If we look at bleeding, the bleeding story is a little more complex. You would certainly expect there to be a reduction in bleeding. And when you look at the powered BARC 2 to 5 bleeding, um, uh, there tr were trends towards less BARC 2 to 5 bleeding compared to the historical controls, but it actually didn't reach statistical significance. And in retrospect, the reason was is that while BARC 3 to 5 bleeding in Zions v. USA was very carefully collected, it turns out that BARC 2 bleeding was not. So actually, this was uh, uh, probably uh, not the optimal design to assess bleeding. But fortunately, in a non-powered endpoint, they looked at BARC 3 or 5 bleeding. This is the severe major bleeding or fatal bleeding. And this was collected equally in both experiences. And you could see in um, the propensity adjusted analysis, there were marked reductions in both Zions 90 and Zions 28 in Timmy major bleeding. 
And then finally, what about stent thrombosis in Zions 90? This was a pre-specified endpoint between three and 12 months. Um, and they had anticipated a 5% stent thrombosis rate, uh, a 0.5% stent thrombosis rate. Yeah, so the performance yeah, goal had to be less than 1.2%. And you can see they observed only a 0.2% stent yeah, thrombosis rate. So deep. very little stent thrombosis rate on the thromboresistant Zions platform. And if you looked at Zions 28, this was a non-powered analysis, but it seemed that one month of um, DAPT was as good as six months of DAPT compared to the Zions v. USA experience. So what would I conclude about the safety of early DAPT discontinuation after Zions? The fluoropolymer coated everolimus eluting stents have been associated with very low stent thrombosis rates and even lower than with bare metal stents. And that available data suggests that DAPT discontinuation after one month in many everolimus eluted treated high bleeding risk patients is safe resulting in low rates of ischemia and stent thrombosis and associated with a reduction in major bleeding. Um, so we, we can't apply this yet to all patients, to STEMI patients, to very complex PCI. Um, it would probably apply to those patients, but we don't have that data. But certainly for the majority of the patients we're doing in the cath lab, this one month or three month of DAP strategy, either with aspirin or clopidogrel monotherapy seems um, uh, very safe, reducing major bleeding without an increase in ischemic complications. Um, and finally, uh, these are brand new data and formal guidelines and both FDA and European regulatory labeling um, indications are pending. So thank you very much. Again, a pleasure for me to join you today and give you this talk. Thanks very much indeed, Greg. That was an absolute tour de force of the uh, of the Zions platform and the available data in the real world. Um, we're running a little bit behind time. There, there have been some audience questions, which I hope we can take. If you're able to stay at the end of this session, we'll have an audience and panel Q&A. Sure. And I would uh, encourage the audience to post questions via the Q&A function. Uh, so without further ado, let's move on to Sripal Bangalore. Sripal is going to segue from the, the, the issue of real world data and just tell us a bit about how the stent design and polymer combination may be important, in particular, with respect to DAP duration in ACS. Sripal. You may be on mute, Sripal. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, can indeed. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And I, I think uh, it's a pleasure to join here. And thank you, Dr. Salvamani and uh, Dr. Nick West for having me on this um, uh, uh, seminar today. And I think it's, it's always very difficult to follow Dr. Stone, uh, but I'll uh, uh, do my best. And I think this is a nice segue into what we should do in terms of DAP duration in ACS in 2020. So let me start off by this. I mean, this is the latest guidelines. Uh, if you look at PCI for acute coronary syndromes, this is what uh, the, either the US guidelines or the European guidelines uh, say in terms of required uh, DAP duration after acute coronary syndromes. As we can all see here, it's a class one indication to use a DAP for at least 12 months after acute coronary syndromes. And this is consistent across uh, both the US and the European guidelines. And if, you, and if you look back um, uh, at least a decade and a half, um, the guidelines have remained consistent in terms of a recommended DAP duration for ACS patient, whereas in stable coronary artery disease patient, uh, the guidelines have moved towards a, sh a shorter DAP duration. So this kind of will be the framework of my discussion, whether this paradigm uh, really applies to what we have in 2020. Uh, we heard a lot about uh, high bleeding risk and what is the definition. Uh, so the ARC definition now kind of uh, streamlines what should be the high bleeding risk criteria. And of course, this slide shows all of the criteria that goes into what could be categorized as high bleeding risk. I won't go through all uh, uh, these in detail. You heard it from Dr. Stone's uh, presentation already, but um, suffice to say that uh, age greater than or equal to 75 years itself uh, puts the patient in high bleeding risk. And we are taking care of many of these uh, group of patients. Uh, so the way this high bleeding risk status came into uh, definition came into being was um, using a threshold bark three or five bleeding risk of uh, greater than 4% or intracranial hemorrhage risk of uh, greater than 1% at one year. 
I think all of us would recognize that uh, if you have such high numbers, intracranial, intracranial hemorrhage of uh, greater than 1% per at one year, that's pretty important bleeding to uh, prevent. And of course, you've heard from the previous talk that bleeding is closely tied to mortality and we should do everything we can to reduce the risk of bleeding. So in terms of dab duration consideration, of course, as you heard from Dr. Stone, we have to balance uh, ischemic events versus uh, bleeding events. And typically, if you look at this paradigm, in order to prevent ischemic events, we would gen generally say you should go longer on dab. And if you want to prevent bleeding event, you should go shorter on dab. So there is always this tension between either uh, trying to prevent ischemic events or to prevent uh, bleeding events. Um, so what have we done so far? So uh, again, you heard some of this, but I want to summarize. Uh, what we know from all of the stent design uh, changes is that strut thickness uh, as a cl is critically important for thrombogenicity. The, the thicker the strut, there is more uh, foreign body reaction, greater recirculation, stagnation of blood pool, and uh, definitely more increased thrombogenicity. This is uh, Elazar Edelman's uh, group looking at a thin multi-link vision stent, 81 uh, micron. And if you just double the thickness of the stent, you see that it becomes 50-fold more thrombogenic. So stent, stent thickness um, uh, is important for thrombogenicity. So the thinner the st uh, stent, the less thrombogenic it is. And of course, you may say, how, how does this matter uh, in this day and age when most of the stents are thin strut stents? It does matter because if you uh, malapose a stent, you're increasing the effective strut thickness and uh, considerably increasing uh, stent thrombogenicity. And of course, uh, we have come a long way in, stunt, uh, in, in terms of strut thickness. Uh, so from the 130 to 140 micron taxis and cipher, now we have the thin strutted uh, devices and there are other stents which are also ultra thin. So the stents have become thinner, the polymer have become uh, thinner. So the other aspects of uh, drug eluding stent is the polymer. And as you see on the stent, uh, the first generation drug eluding stents had a number of polymer related issues. And the reason I want to bring this uh, uh, to the forefront is there is a lingering notion that polymers are bad, even to this date. And of course, this is kind of the legacy effect of the first generation drug eluding stents, uh, which had a number of uh, different issues. And we saw events, not just during the one year of after stent implantation, but late after, and it was been uh, it has been uh, attributed to the problems with the polymer. Delayed endothelialization is a consequence of both the strut thickness and polymer composition, and of course the polymer-related problems add its own solutions. And so, the because we had problems with the first generation durable polymer DES. Uh, uh, the solutions were uh, to uh, have a better polymer in the sense that uh, the second generation durable polymer um, um, were better, more biocompatible. And the other uh, solutions were to have a biodegradable polymer DES. And of course, uh, when we talk about biodegradable polymer, not all uh, polymer degrades uh, along the same uh, timelines. There are some which degrades uh, quicker within a few months, some uh, degrade within a few months to a year, and some have longer term biodegradability, a few years. And, but the concept is that you're left with a bare metal or a bare metal like stents. And of course, the third pathway was to develop polymer free DS, uh, going with the concept that let's not, uh, let's get away with polymers, polymers are bad, just uh, have uh, a different mechanism to have the drug on the stent and let's just salute it so that you're left with a bare metal stent. I won't talk much about the biodegradable and polymer free DES, but it suffice to say that after a decade of uh, trials with these uh, platforms, these platforms have not shown superiority. If anything, they are non-inferior to current durable polymer DES, but none of them have shown to be superior uh, unless they're on ultra uh, thin uh, strut platform. And of course, uh, now, um, uh, so the lingering um, notion that polymers are bad, I mean, you know, we need to get rid of that because the newer generation polymer, uh, the polymers on the Zions platform and the newer, uh, on the other second generation DES uh, are much better, more biocompatible. And as you heard from uh, Dr. Stone's presentation, uh, especially with the Zions platform, it could be potentially thrombo uh, resistant. Uh, I want to show this example. So this is the examination trial. Uh, of course, uh, this trial is now eight years old. 
Uh, but the reason I want to sh show this is uh, this is a trial of uh, patients with ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Patients who are uh, randomized to bare metal. This is the uh, vision stent and compared with that of a Zion stent. And the key thing to recognize is these are the same stent platform except with the Zions as the polymer and the drug. And uh, of course, at the uh, at 12 months, uh, Zion significantly reduced the definite probability of stent thrombosis compared to bare metal stent. And that's not the reason I want to show the slide. I want to show the slide mainly to focus on the first 30 days. Look what happens within the first 30 days. Significant lower number of uh, stent thrombosis with the Zion's platform when compared to bare metal stents. This is a time point when um, you know every patient were on dual antiplatelet therapy. So what then? Is the, is the likely explanation for a reduced thrombogenicity of this platform. And as I said, the only difference in the design is this, this platform as the polymer on the drug. It's likely not the drug, but it's most likely the polymer. So this brings up the question, is the fluoropolymer thromboresistant? And of course, the surgeons will say that uh, we have known about this for a, no a long time. This is an untreated uh, uh, Dacron graph. When you put it in the blood pool, you see clot formation. This, when you coat it with the fluoropolymer, you see that it becomes uh, thromboresistant. And of course, uh, Elazar Adelman's group also showed this. I mean, we saw this data on the 81 micron bare metal stents. If you double the thickness, 50% increase in thrombogenicity. If you keep the same stent th thickness, but Coat it with the fluoropolymer, uh, in other words, make it into a Zion stent, you see that even though the thickness is the same, uh, the fluoropolymer makes it 24% thromboresistant. So um, significant uh, interesting data from uh, uh, in vitro models that uh, this uh, platform is thromboresistant. You know, I'm particularly impressed with this data from uh, Renu Varmani and Alok Fenn uh, as to what happens when you implant a stent. So this is a stent that is implanted. On the left panel, you see a bare metal stent. On the right panel, you see the fluoropolymer stent. And what you see is a time, uh, uh, time a map of platelet uh, coverage. And the, the time map goes up to an hour. So within an hour, you see that significant number of platelets adhere to the bare metal stuff surface. And if you look at the pl uh, fluoropolymer surface, there is like considerably less platelet adhesion to this surface, uh, indicating potential thromboresistant of this uh, platform. And of course, uh, so the newer generation uh, drug eluding stents with the reduced stent, uh, thickness and the better polymer uh, results in faster endothelialization and reduced thrombogenicity. So these are not just in vitro models. You've seen some data from, uh, from the previous talk, but here I want to show a snapshot of what we have uh, achieved in the, uh, in the last two decades of stent progress. So if you look at the reduction in stent thrombosis, uh, restenosis, significant progress, starting with the bare metal stent, we have uh, cut down restenosis by uh, two thirds. If you look at myocardial infarction, we have made significant progress in reducing uh, myocardial infarction with the newer generation stents. And uh, if you look at some of the platforms, at least the cobalt chromium everolimus eluding stents, there is a significant reduction in stent thrombosis when compared to bare metal stent. And finally, if you look at uh, death, again, uh, st stents which are very efficacious are reducing restenosis and thrombo stent thrombosis also reduce uh, death when compared to a bare metal uh, platform. Um, and, uh, and more data looking at acute thrombogenicity of, uh, for, for, for example, these are some of the newer generation stents, Synergy, Orsiro, Nobori, Biometric Flex, and Zions. This is a confocal microscopic picture of platelet adhesion and thrombus formation. And of course, you can see that there is some thrombus formation even with some of the newer stents, but with the fluoropolymer Zion stent, you can barely see the stent uh, indicating that uh, there is less uh, platelet adhesion uh, to the stents. So let's go back to our drawing board uh, about ischemic events and bleeding events. So what have we done uh, to reduce ischemic events? And we made significant progress in stent uh, strut thickness and polymer composition. So the stent thrombosis rate have significantly reduced. What have we done for bleeding events? Uh, so there is some decrease in periprocedural bleeding events by adapting radial uh, procedures and uh, using, uh, you know, staying away from 2B3A inhibitors unless it's absolutely needed. And of course, using bivalerin, uh, et cetera. But I must say there has been an overall increase in uh, bleeding risk for a patient because we are using more and more potent P2Y12 inhibitors. Uh, of course, our patients have more increased life expectancy. So consequently, we have more elderly patients. Many patients develop atrial fibrillation, needs to be an anticoagulation therapy. So we are reducing bleeding, but uh, uh, no change or if anything, increase in bleeding events. So what can we do? Uh, 
We talked about this in terms of DAP duration, the guidelines for ACS would recommend one year DAP duration. Um, and of course, if the patient is at high bleeding risk, it's a 2A or a 2B indication to go down to a six months DAP duration. Let's come back and revisit this. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Stone showed much of this data in terms of uh, fluoropolymer and uh, stent and implication for shorter DAP duration. We'll, uh, we talked about the sharp DAP too. I won't go um, much about it, but just to focus on the ACS part, which is the topic for today. So in the stop, uh, stop DAP two, so a third of them, 38% of patients had acute coronary syndrome. And we saw that uh, the one month DAP with continuation of clopidogrel um, after uh, one month of DAP um, was uh, not only non-inferior, but also superior, mainly driven by a reduced bleeding, but no impact on um, uh, ischemic events. And we also heard about the Zion uh, uh, short DAP program, the 90 day and the 28, 28 day program. And I also want to emphasize that um, uh, a third of these patients had acute coronary syndrome. Of course, STEMI was an exclusion. I had the privilege to be on the executive committee for this uh, program. And it's uh, very reassuring to see that both the plat uh, strategies that the 90 day or the 28 day DAP duration significantly reduced BARC three to five uh, bleeding. But of course we didn't have to pay a price in terms of uh, stent thrombosis. Overall stent thrombosis rates were uh, extremely low regardless of whether it was a 90 day duration of uh, DAP versus a, a 28 day duration. So now, uh, keeping all of these in mind, I mean, given what we have done with our stent uh, technology, and of course, you know, I haven't even started talking about uh, implant technology use of uh, intravascular imaging, which can further drive down your event rates. So what is the optimal duration of du uh, dual antiplatelet therapy after PCI with uh, acute coronary syndrome? So this is not really, not just restricted to patients with high bleeding risk, but in general, if you have acute coronary syndromes, for two decades, we've been saying the duration of DAP should be, um, uh, 12 months. So this is a, a recent data we published a couple of weeks ago, uh, looking at, uh, uh, this is a network meta-analysis of randomized trials. So 14 trials, 31,000 patients with acute coronary syndromes and dividing patients into, uh, dividing the treatment arm uh, into the traditional 12 month, greater than 12 month DAP duration or a shorter DAP duration of uh, less than or equal to three months or six months DAP duration. And the principal finding of this is when you compare it with the uh, ACS recommended 12 months DAP duration, uh, if you look at uh, greater than 12 months, of course, significant increase in bleeding. If you look at uh, three months or less, significant reduced bleeding when compared to 12 months. So with shorter DAP duration, decreased bleeding, but if you look at stent thrombosis, uh, uh, either uh, three or six months, there is no significant price you pay in increasing stent thrombosis. So what we concluded here is that the data from this meta-analysis supports short-term, uh, less than or equal to three or six months DAPT in patients with acute coronary syndromes, and guidelines may need to consider short DAPT even in patients with uh, ACS, especially in this era of neurogeneration deglutting stent. So this is something to keep in mind that the paradigm we saw with stable ischemic heart disease may potentially apply to acute coronary syndromes. But of course, I mean, many of us would say we need to have more data for STEMI patients. Moving forward along these lines, I mean, I think there is more and more recognition that uh, potentially single antiplatelet therapy may be uh, beneficial in many of these patients by reducing the risk of uh, bleeding. So when we may, when you talk about SAP, we are talking about either dropping aspirin or P2Y12 after a short course of dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, we talked about uh, the number of these uh, trials, but I want to also emphasize the TWILIGHT trial. In TWILIGHT trial, high-risk patients with PC, uh, who underwent PCI were uh, enrolled, and after a three-month period of time, they were randomized to either uh, dual amplitude therapy of aspirin and tacaglor versus a SAPT uh, therapy of dropping aspirin and con con continuing uh, tacaglor uh, alone. And in this trial, we saw a significant uh, decrease in bleeding if you used a Kagro monotherapy when compared to a dual antiplatelet therapy. And at the same time, there was no price to pay in terms of uh, ischemic endpoints. There was no difference in death, MI, or stroke. So that leads us to the question. So we all agree that uh, we should go short on DAPT. Uh, but when we go with the short-term DAP duration, what should we then do? Should we just continue aspirin? Uh, should we uh, just do what Twilight does? Uh, should we do P2Y12? So we published this recently, a couple of weeks ago in American Heart Journal, asking this very question, what should we do after a short course of DAP? And of course, uh, this is data from um, 
a number of trials with over 50,000 patient years, uh, patients uh, uh, randomized in these trials, looking at after a short course of uh, uh, DAPT, should we continue P2Y12 versus aspirin? What we showed was whether you continue aspirin or P2Y12 when you compare it to DAPT, uh, there is significant reduction in bleeding. And of course, if you look at stent thrombosis, again, you don't pay a price in terms of uh, increase in stent, and stent thrombosis by uh, continuing a monotherapy with either aspirin or P2Y12. But the more important question is, uh, can we choose which, to, uh, which direction to go? And of course, this is a hypothesis generating in this study, what we showed was if you really want to prevent bleeding, if your patient is at a very high risk of bleeding, if you want to prevent bleeding, perhaps continuing aspirin after a short course of uh, DAP may be the way to go. But if your patient is at high ischemic uh, risk and you want to prevent stent thrombosis, maybe continuing a uh, SAPT mono, um, um, uh, the uh, P2Y12 monotherapy after a short course of DAP may have uh, the best impact. This is the probability of, that a given treatment is uh, best. So the higher probability would mean uh, better at preventing that particular uh, endpoint. So something to keep in mind. You know, I showed a lot of data about fluoropolymer. There are uh, data uh, for other uh, um, platforms as well. And as you can see on the slide, I know in the interest of time, I, I want to conclude with this. So in terms of strategies to minimize, maximize benefit risk ratio for our patients. So what can we do to prevent, uh, reduce ischemic events? Of course, if your ischemic events is not just stent related, but it's also st not stent related. For stent related, of course, the current generation drug eluting stents do a pretty fantastic job at reducing stent related events. But we also want to make sure that we optimize uh, deployment, use IVUS guidance, et cetera. But now the pharmacotherapy has considerably advanced. So we have significant improvement in non stent related uh, events by use of high intensity statins, PCSK9. Uh, perhaps low-dose low anticoagulant strategy for patients who are diabetic, SGLT2s, uh, et cetera. Uh, but what can we do to reduce bleeding events? Uh, so potentially you could, you should, we can go shorter adapt in a majority of a patient and uh, consider longer-term uh, SAP with either aspirin or P2Y12. So I think it, at the end of the day, it's all about uh, balance. We have to be, uh, balance the bleeding and uh, ischemic risk on our patients. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much indeed, Sripal. That was really clear. Um, and I just would, just a quick plug, we, uh, we have recently completed an ISS in Japan. Professor Kimura has finished recruiting for the Stop That 2 ACS study. Obviously, we will not have results yet, but I think that will add to the body of evidence that you've <coughs> outlined in addition to those networked meta-analyses. So switching now from antiplatelet therapy to the other thing that Sripal, you very nicely segged into, which is the addition of intravascular imaging to improve safety in PCI. And I'm delighted to uh, mention, to introduce Dr. Ronnie Matthew, who's going to present results from the IOPTICO study. Many of you will be familiar with this study. Um, he's presented it several times. In fact, we, we keep meeting on the internet to discuss this study. So I'm looking forward to hearing it again and any new insights you might have. Ronnie, over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nick. I hope you can uh, see my slides now. Yes, indeed. Great. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here to present the IOPTICO study. Thank you, Dr. Selvamani. It's also a pleasure to have on this uh, webinar, Dr. Greg Stone, Dr. Nick West, Dr. Sripal, and of course, my teacher, Dr. A.B. Mehta. So IOPTICO study was a multi-center prospective study performed in South Asia. And uh, the study was basically to study the impact of OCT and angio co-registration. I have no particular disclosure. However, IOPTICO, though was an investigator initiated study, it was supported by a research grant from the Abbott Vascular. Now the objective, as I stated, was to deter determine the impact of real-time OCT and angio co-registration on physician decision-making for PCI optimization in South Asia. We were very privileged to have nine high volume sites from India and Bangladesh in this. And these were the sites as I've enumerated here. We also had the core lab at the Madras Medical Mission where Dr. Vijay Kumar was looking at all the angiograms and the OCTs. <clears throat> 
The primary objective of the IOPTICO was to assess the change in treatment strategy with OCT and ACR. And the change in pre-PCI strategy, the variables that were noted were the need for lesion preparation, a change in the intended stent length and diameter, a change in the intended device landing zone, or a change in stenting strategy. The post-PCI optimization was the identification of stent malaposition, edge dissection, stent under-expansion, plaque prolapse, or an incomplete lesion coverage. The secondary objectives of the IOPTICO with the procedural outcomes, MACE at six months and one year, and the cath lab metrics <clears throat> that included the time required for performing an OCT and ACR and the additional contrast volume. Now we are a very interest, interesting study flow. If you look at the study flow, once an angiogram was performed, Based on the angiogram, the physician was asked to define a PCI strategy based on the variables I just discussed. Then the OCT was performed. Once the OCT was performed with the additional information from OCT, a need for a change in strategy was documented. At this point, the angio co-registration was applied. And based on the ACR data, a need for further change in strategy was noted. Based on these findings, finally, the PCI was performed. Once the PCI was completed, uh, OCT was again done. And a need for PCI optimization based on the findings of either a dissection or a malaposition or the variables that I just discussed, an optimization of the PCI was done. And at that point, the ACR was again applied to see if there was a further change in the strategy. This was a study flow that was used. Now we enrolled 500 patients between November 2018 to March 2020 from nine sites across India and Bangladesh. 25 patients were excluded from the primary endpoint analysis due to inadequate imaging. So 472 patients are included in this analysis as per protocol. Two patients died after three months of the PCI. The six month follow-up is ongoing. We have completed 443 patients. The 12 month follow-up is also ongoing. These are the baseline characteristics of the patients. They're moderately high risk patients. If you look at the diabetes, it was seen in about 51% of patients. Hypertension was in 57%. Renal dysfunction was seen in 7%. The indication for PCI, about 50% of patients or more than 50% of patients had acute coronary syndrome, non-STEMI acute coronary syndromes. So overall, in a high volume center in India, this is a real world patient population that you get. If you look at the lesion characteristics, similarly, moderately complex lesions, B1 and C, accounted for nearly 85% of the lesions. Some form of calcification and OCT was noted in about 50% of patients. Coming to the results, if you look at the left panel, there was a change in PCI strategy once OCT was performed after angio in 76% of patients. And this included a uh, further need for lesion preparation in 25%, a change in stent length in 53%, stent diameter in 36%, a change in stenting strategy in 4%, and a changing landing zone in 61%. On the right panel, 
adding ACR or angio co registration further changed PCI decision making or decision strategy in about 22% of patients, which again included a change in lesion preparation, a need for stent length, a change in stent diameter, and a change in the landing zone in about 16%. Once PCI was performed, post-PCI with OCT, OCT identified a problem which required additional intervention overall in about 30% of patients. And this included stent under expansion in 15%, stent malaposition in 15%, edge dissection in 3%, tissue prolapse in 7% patients. When we added ACR post-PCI, we did not see any additional strategy change as expected. Coming to the secondary endpoints, on the left side, if you see the time for conduct of OCT and ACR, pre-procedure, we needed an average of about 14 minutes or so to do the OCT and ACR, while post-procedure, the time was a little more higher, and that was because of the second OCT run that needed to be done for op optimization once we identified a problem. If you look at the need for contrast volume, for each procedure, the total contrast used was about 200 ml, and additional contrast needed for OCT was about 40 ml. So if you look at the overall impact of OCT and ACR during PCI, <clears throat> we see that pre-procedure OCT changed decision-making in 86% of patients and post-procedure in 30% of patients. And overall, OCT and angio co registration changed angiographic-based decision in about 90% of lesions. So to conclude, this is the first South Asian study reporting the outcomes of OCT and ACR-guided PCI in patients with coronary artery disease. OCT and ACR changed angiographic-based decision in 90% of our lesions overall. Pre-procedure OCT change strategy in 76% of lesions. Angio co-registration additionally change strategy in 22% lesions. Post-procedure OCT change strategy in 30% of lesions. Our one-year clinical follow-up data will be reported earlier. Now, before I conclude, I just wanted to slowly show you one more slide. And that is... The two studies that were presented at TCT, the two OCD trials, two different geographies. On the left is the iOptico study, and on the right was a light lab study. If you look at it very interestingly, both of them more or less had the same result. About 85 to 90% change in decision making with optical coherence tomography for percutaneous coronary intervention. Thank you all for your kind attention. And let me also thank all my co-investigators at the Apex Heart Institute, Ruby Hall, Leelawati Hospital, Medanta, Apollo Hospital, Max Super Speciality, the National Heart Foundation in Dhaka, Meenakshi Mission Hospital, and Dr. Vijay Kumar at the CoLab in Chennai. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Ronnie. Excellent presentation, and thanks for drawing the parallels there with the US-based Light Lab initiative. So we do have uh, about five minutes for some questions just before we go live uh, to Dr. Sameen Sharma in New York for the live case in the keynote. Um, could we possibly have the audience Q&A on the screen? We won't, we won't be able to answer all of these, um, but we'll try and answer some of them. Uh, and obviously we have an expert panel as well, Dr. Dr. M.S. Hiramath from Ruby Hall in Pune, Dr. Ashwin Mehta from Cardiology Jaslok Hospital in Mumbai, Dr. Praveen Chandra from Medanta Medicity in Gurgaon, 
Dr. Ajit Malasarai from the Madras Medical Mission and Dr. Thomas Alexander from the Kobai Medical Center and Hospital in Coimbatore. So I think I'm going to pick one of these. Um, if Greg's still on the line, Greg, can I ask you to, to address the second one? Do you think these results, I'm presuming that they're talking about the Zions 28 and Zions 90 results, will lead to a recommendation for short adapt from the ACC? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I don't know what the ACC, AHA, US guidelines will do. Uh, I think that's hard to predict. Uh, you know, they obviously uh, reserve, in most cases, their class one guidelines for randomized trial data. Uh, I do think they're going to clearly recognize um, uh, the role of short gap for drug eluding stents. But how they differentiate one stent versus another in the guidelines, I don't know, uh, because they don't like to do that. They really should do that. I can. I mean, stents are different from each other. P2Y12 inhibitors are different from each other. But the U.S. guidelines are notorious for not wanting to call out different uh, specific devices and drugs. I think a better prediction would probably be what the U.S. FDA would do. And I also try not to usually make predictions on what the FDA would do. <laughs> but I think that uh, these were very carefully conducted studies uh, that were done in con with FDA, and they met all of their uh, pre-specified endpoints, except for perhaps the secondary endpoint of BARC 2 to 5 bleeding, which I think is understandable. But most importantly, the safety was there. So I would expect a label to be granted from the US FDA on the basis of the Zions 28 and Zions 90 day data. Uh, yeah, but we'll you... again, have to see as it works its way through. Sure. I mean, as you say, it's, it's a shame about the, the primary bleeding endpoint. Um, BARC 2 to 5 was chosen, but I think even though BARC 3 to 5 was the only directly ascertainable uh, amount of bleeding, I think consensus right. would indicate that that is the, the, probably the end point that people will choose in the future as it represents more serious bleeding. Yeah, of um, course. Perhaps I can ask you the, the other question that's, that's on the screen here, which is that the Zion's 90 and 28 data are excellent and promising. What is your approach with type A lesions and chip cases? Now that's a fairly broad question, um, but uh, maybe just a couple. Of, I mean, Sripal has left us, so I think I think he's left you in the lurch to answer this one. So, uh, any comment on that one? You know, so I think that um, we do know in general that the longer the duration of DAP, the lower the rate of myocardial infarction and stent thrombosis. Uh, that's a general um, truth. Uh, that I think holds in stable CAD, it holds in uh, acute coronary syndromes. Uh, but of course, the longer the duration of DAP, the higher the risk of bleeding. So one has to, again, weigh this incidence of uh, ischemic complications versus um, bleeding complications. So type A lesions have, will have a very low rate of ischemic complications. So with type A lesions, you should have a lower threshold to use shorter DAP. Uh, I would say that if the patient's a low bleeding risk patient, then uh, for a type A lesion and a non-acute coronary syndrome patient, then six months of DAPT is more than adequate and probably three months of DAPT is even fine as your standard, although the current guidelines are six months. As the patient goes with a type A lesion goes to a moderate risk of bleeding and then a high risk of bleeding, then I definitely would lower the DAPT down to three months and then to one month in the type A lesion. The CHIP patient is a little more complicated. The, I and I would put the CHIP patient and patients with acute coronary syndromes. Um, there, you would think that 12 months of DAPT is more of the standard. Um, uh, so when you shorten it, you've got to decide again on the relative bleeding risk. Uh, so you would shorten it probably to six months if the patient's at mild to moderate increased risk of bleeding and probably down to about three months if the patient's at increased risk of bleeding. And even then, possibly one month if the patient's at extreme risk of bleeding. So again, you have to individualize every case. Not all CHIP cases are created equal. Um, and again, the bleeding risks can vary. And in this regard, uh, either you, you, you can understand what the individual risk factors are, or there are very good risk scores that you can use. I think the precise DAP score is probably, in my estimation, the best bleeding score. Um, so that might be one to really get to know, but there are very good uh, uh, scores, the Paris score, the DAP score, and other scores that you could use to make these decisions. Great, thanks very much. I, I think just, I'll just pick one more of these. I think this is a reasonably straightforward comment. Um, 
Do you think biodegradable polymer stents are the way forward or are stable polymers the safest? And I think I'd be interested in your view on this, but I think that the data that Sri Power showed us showed that biodegradable polymers don't offer any clear or tangible advantages over stable polymers per se, I think. Yeah, I think that's very clear. Um, uh, you know, I mean, there was a lot of excitement originally about biodegradable polymers um, because initially it was thought that bare metal stents are the safest and polymers have inflammatory reactions and, uh, um, and, and some polymers, of course, may promote platelet deposition. So let's get rid of the polymer and then we'll have long-term safety. Uh, but of course, the fallacies there are that one, really good durable polymers are not only as safe as bioabsorbable poly polymers, but they may be safer. And you've seen the fluorinated um, polymer characteristics of the Zion stent that, that gives it that. Two, bioabsorbable polymers cause inflammation. You always get inflammation from the bioabsorption process. Sometimes it's minimal inflammation, but that can cause a problem before they bioabsorb. And three, and probably most important, there's a huge amount of data now that's looking at, at the totality of the evidence and hundreds of thousands of uh, patient years of follow-up that really show no major difference in long-term safety outcomes just based on durable versus bioabsorbable polymer. So I don't think that's what the decision should be made on in an otherwise good step. Okay, thanks very much indeed. I, I think that's a, that's a very clear answer. I'm just going to ask uh, uh, Dr. Ronnie Matthew just to expand on on just one thing from uh, that he touched on at the end of his talk. Ronnie, you showed the slide comparing your Ioptico data with the the Light Lab data. Do you, do you want to give a further comment on the importance of that comparison and its applicability to OCT to all populations? Absolutely, because. Uh, uh... I think uh, I was also very uh, surprised to uh, see these results because if you look, these are two OCD trials that have been done in two different continents, two different geographies, two racially different people, two different investigators who had no contact with each other. In fact, I did not know about the Light Lab initiative going on in the U United States. And yet, if you look at that, more or less similar results. And, and what that tells you is that whatever is your population, whatever is your complexity of the lesion or the type of patients that you see, if you do imaging, if you do optical coherence tomography, you do change decision-making in about 85 to 90% of patients. And importantly, it is pre-PCI change that is seen in a majority because the reason I am uh, I'm telling you this is normally an OCD is done post-procedure to just see if you've got a malapposition or under expansion and you just get away with it. But if you do a, a, a OCT pre-PCI, you do find a lot of changes that you could incorporate to precisely implant your stent correctly and uh, finally to optimize it. So a pre-PCI OCT is very important. Both the trials, the iOptico and the Light Lab initiative done in two different places did show you the same similar things. Great, thank you very much indeed. Um, I do apologize to the panel. I'm afraid we've had, uh, we've had uh, such excellent talks. We've run slightly over time and I'm aware we need to get to New York for the live case, but I hope everyone will be able to stay on to comment on the live case and there will be much more time I'm sure for some questions. Um, so perhaps I'd like to just thank finally for this session, uh, Dr. Greg Stone, Dr. Sripar Bangalore, who I know has run off the cath lab already, and Dr. Ronnie Matthew for their excellent presentations. I think it's really illustrated two very important parts of um, the, if you like, the patient-centric journey in tailoring DAPT duration to balance ischemic and bleeding risks, and also really doing the PCI correctly by using intracoronary imaging. And I think there is some overlap really there in terms of the safety and efficacy of strategies moving forward. So perhaps now we can switch to the, the live case that's coming from Mount Sinai Hospital uh, in New York. And um, I'm gonna hand back to Dr. Selva Mani, I think who's on the screen right now, who is going to introduce Dr. Samin Sharma. Yeah, but after an excellent learning session from the masters, uh, we will just move on to live case uh, as Dr. Nick uh, said.